without further ado, we'll go straight to our first speaker, David Quiroga uh, Martinez from Aarhus University. He will tell us about sensory versus culturally shaped expectations and the neural processing of music. And I have to say the abstract uh, really was intriguing. David, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the introduction. I will just uh, pull this full screen. Can you see the presentation full screen? Looks great. Excellent. Um, yeah, so uh, I work at the Music in the Brain Center in Office Denmark. And let's get to business directly. So when we listen to music, we are all the time trying to predict what comes next. And this happens, for example, when we sing along um, with the um, with a song that we know very well, or when we uh, dance to the music and try to predict when the next beat is going to come, or when we uh, play music together because we're trying to anticipate what other musicians are doing. But also composers know this very well because they all the time play with our expectations to create surprise and emotion. So there are two main um, stories about where do these musical expectations come from. So one of them is that, um, they come from the statistical learning of the regularities of musical styles uh, and cultures. But there is another view that says that they come from simply learning the sensory properties of the sounds that we are listening to at the moment. And these two things are highly overlapped and it's very difficult to uh, disentangle. Them. So one case where this happens, which is actually the topic of this talk, is the case of pitch intervals. So a pitch interval is basically the distance uh, in fundamental frequency between two consecutive sounds in a melody. And it turns out that in, in Western tonal music, uh, small pitch intervals are very, very, very frequent and likely, whereas larger intervals are much rare. So you would expect that uh, people who are acquainted with this musical style uh, learn to predict smaller intervals in preference to larger intervals. But at the same time, the tones that conform a small interval are more similar in terms of uh, the frequencies. So it's a physical property that makes them also more similar than uh, larger intervals. So statistics and acoustics are highly correlated in this case. How can we disentangle these things? Well, first, uh, a way that we have to measure uh, cultural expectations is computational model, and in particular, information dynamics of music, or idiom for short, uh, which is a model in which we uh, try to estimate the probability that a given sound will follow in a melody. And this uh, probability is calculated from learning the patterns that have appeared in the melodies in the past or that have appeared in a corpus of music that we used to train the model with. And then we derive a measure of surprise, which is called information content, which is just the negative logarithm of the probability. So the higher the information content, it means that the higher the surprising, uh, the surprise of the sound is. And then what you can see here is just the uh, profile, the information content profile of a melody. Uh, and you can see that there are some peaks of notes that are very unexpected, but also some valleys where notes are very, very expected. So in my PhD, what I did was uh, to try to see if we can find the neural correlates of these expectations. Uh, and for that, I use MEG or magnetoencephalography to measure the magnetic activity uh, that came from people's brains when they were listening to different melodies. And what I found is that the evoked response uh, around 100 milliseconds after sound onset is strongly modulated by these information content values that we calculated with the computational model. So that the higher the information content, the larger the peak of this N1 response to the sound. So one may think that this is a neural correlate of cultural expectations. However, as I told you before, there might be a compound. So indeed, in uh, our melodies, um, interval size was strongly correlated with the probability of the intervals that we were um, uh, modeling. So that means that larger intervals not only were larger physically, but also they, they had larger information content and smaller intervals, they have uh, smaller information content. So it might be 
that uh, what we are actually seeing in the neural responses has nothing to do with culture or statistics, but instead it has to do more with the physical distance in the frequency dimension between consecutive sounds. So I, I wanted to disentangle these two things. And for that, I analyzed a data set that actually my collaborator, uh, Dr. Marina Klushko collected, in which uh, we recorded uh, the brain magnetic activity uh, from 17 Chinese listeners and 20 Danish listeners who were listening to traditional Chinese melodies or traditional German melodies. So two different musical styles or cultures. Uh, and then people just needed to pay attention to the melodies and detect some sounds that were played with different instruments. So they had to pay attention, but the expectations themselves were not task relevant. To analyze the data, what I did was uh, to compare uh, different regression models, including different predictors to see which predictors actually predicted better the neural activity. And uh, I used a set of cultural predictors which correspond to idiom models which were trained on either German a corpus of music or a Chinese corpus of music. But also I included sensory predictors which included the absolute pitch between uh, uh, consecutive sounds, so interval size, but also a measure of how the sensory representations of consecutive sounds in the auditory cortex uh, how similar these representations were. And this is, um, I use a cosine similarity between these representations as a measure of similarity, precisely. Uh, and the way I, I estimated these representations is through a computational model that other people have uh, previously developed uh, in which they simulate the filtering that happens along the auditory pathway for these neural representations. Uh, and finally, I had a null model which only included the envelope of the signal as a predictor. So it's a very, very acoustic model that has nothing to do with expectations or pitch. And then uh, for the analysis, I used this uh, encoding model, which is based on uh, linear regression, in which we just try to predict the neural activity, here symbolized by R, neural responses, from a combination of predictors, here symbolized by S, uh, and we do this uh, at different time lags. So basically this ends up being a convolution um, to see at what time points this predictor actually modulate the neural responses of the participant. And then we just use a least squares estimator uh, to estimate the weights that relate the sensory, in the, sensor, the stimulus and the neural responses. Uh, as a measure of performance of these models to compare them, I obtained the correlation between the predicted and the actual neural activity, uh, calculated for each participant and for each model. And then I took this to like group level statistics. So these are the results. So here I'm showing you pairwise comparisons between models. And what you can see here is that sensory models clearly win over cultural models. So basically interval size and cosine similarity models win over the idiom model and over the null model, which is just the envelope. Also, interestingly, uh, these models could not be disentangled um, statistically, the, the two sensory models uh, with this design. But if anything, the cosine similarity model seems to be slightly better than the interval size model. And we have this for Chinese melodies and for German melodies, uh, uh, very similar results. Finally, I also uh, compared the two different types of listeners, the two different cultures, uh, and it turns out that there is not a statistical difference between the performance of, the, of these models for different groups of listeners, or there is not an interaction between the model or the, the, the culture that we were um, studying. And I, I want just to show you the time course of these coefficients that we estimated with the with the linear regression model. So these coefficients evolve in time. So they are kind of a proxy for an ERP, like an event response, event related response. Uh, and I know there are many lines here, but what I want to draw the attention to is the blue and the red lines, which are the sensory models, the models that actually won. Uh, and what you can see is that the largest difference with the other models come around 200 milliseconds after sound onset. 
so the coefficients are much larger at this time point. Uh, and this is a time point where the, the traditional P2 component of the auditory response that you usually measure with EEG in humans, uh, this is the, the time point when these models, uh, this models, uh, this P2 component happens. So this is something to investigate further. Uh, we have the same for uh, German melodies, when people were listening to German melodies and to Chinese melodies. Uh, and here I want to show you the topographies of these coefficients. Uh, and what you can see here, if you're familiar with MEG perhaps, uh, what you can see here is clear auditory responses, uh, both 100 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds after onset. But also what you can see here is that these coefficients are stronger for the sensory models than for the EDU models or cultural models. The same for German and for Chinese melodies. Uh, and to conclude, sensory models win over cultural models and a potential mechanism is a stimulus specific adaptation um, in which uh, the auditory system adapts to the current sensory stimulation. And then if you have sounds that are similar to the previous stimulus, then you have smaller responses. But if sounds are different, then you have larger responses. And finally, uh, there is an interesting relationship with behavioral research, uh, which suggests that actually, uh, cultural and sensory expectations coexist and then actually tend to favor a bit more cultural expectations. I just want to thank my collaborators and my lab and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, we have lots of questions and uh, probably not time for all of them. So there are several questions along the lines of what features do you use for the cosine similarity analysis? And I'm gonna uh, go into this one question. Are these features based on the spectrum of each of the notes in an interval? If so, I assume it would give much higher similarities to notes that are harmonically related. And since those intervals, e.g. thirds, fifths, et cetera, are used more often in many musical cultures, how do you disentangle these two possibilities? Uh, yes, um, good, so. Um, so first the model. So uh, basically uh, what I did, I was, um, I took this model of, of the filtering that happens along the auditory pathway, which in the end uh, turns out to be like a tonotopic, tonotopic map. So we have like 40 frequency channels um, that represent uh, the kind, it's kind of a spectrogram uh, what, what, that reaches the auditory cortex. And then this vector of this spectrogram gets compared with between the consecutive sounds. So it's kind of a, a sort of filtering, uh, sorry, uh, frequency domain decomposition uh, that happens in the digital cortex. And then uh, it's just a consigned similarity between these two vectors. Uh, regarding, yes, uh, this is something that I want to investigate further because um, one major factor here is the pure pitch distance between sounds, like physically the, the distance in the, mm -hmm. in the frequency. But also you can imagine that an octave, for example, is more similar uh, than a fifth right? or, or a sixth, for example, mm -hmm. because the octave is just double the frequency. So this is a comparison that I haven't done. So the idea is to include a model in the future that accounts for this uh, uh, harmonicity. Yes, so that's, that's sort of what we want to do. Okay, great. And I'm just gonna ask one more and let you maybe answer the rest uh, in the Q&A later. What about later MEG components? Shouldn't we expect that the early components may be sensory modulated while later components uh, more by other processes? Uh, yes, totally. So this is the experiment that we are actually missing because um, here participants were paying attention, but the, this manipulation was not as relevant. So what we want to do next is a manipulation in which we ask participants directly to rate how expected or unexpected the sounds were and then we should see something like P3 or some other components, later negativities emerging. So this is something that we want to do in the future, yes. Okay, great. That's all the time we have. Uh, thanks for a great talk, David. Yeah, thank you.